you know, as the choir was singing. I was reminded that if the Lord says the same on Tuesday, I will see 50 years old. And I'm so grateful. I should have been dead, supposed to have been dead, all of them supposed to be dead, but I'm still here. By the grace of God, I'm so grateful. Ups and downs and ins and out, but I'm still here and I'm so grateful. God is, God is good and we're thankful for our pastor as God is using him within the body of Christ down in Texas, sharing with Pastor Brackens and it's always our prayers, God will use him mightily and return him home safely. I don't want to keep you long. I um, I know many of you saw Reverend Brown preaching. We're going to get out of church early today. <laughs> I, I won't keep you too long, I promise you. But it is my birthday, and I'll preach how I want to. <laughs> Join me in a very familiar scripture, Romans 8 and 28. Romans 8 and 28 very familiar scripture. Many of you know it by heart. My prayer is that we've drawn fresh water from this familiar well. Let us pray. Dear God, how we bless you and we thank you again for this another opportunity to share, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, God, for keeping us all week long. We thank you for another Thanksgiving season for all the family and friends that you surrounded us with. We pray on now, God, that you will look upon your word today. Look upon me. Let not my sins hinder your word. Father, I need your strength because I am weak. I need your wisdom because I am without it. Look upon the hearts of your people that, may be, that they may be receptive to your word, that someone may be encouraged today, that someone may be enlightened, inspired, and even saved on today. It is in the matchless name of Jesus that we pray and thank you in advance. Amen. Amen. Romans 8, 28 reads as follows according to the English Standard Version. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. Just for a few moments, I'd like to talk on this subject, the promise of the greater good. The promise of the greater good. There was an old story about a shipwreck where many men died. In fact, there was only one 
survivor. The sole survivor reached a small uninhabited island. He prayed for God to rescue him, but help didn't come. Eventually, he built a hut out of old, of old driftwood for protection from the elements. And one day, he returned from a scavenging for food and found his hut up in flames, the smoke rising into the sky. Angrily, he cried out, God, how could you do this to me? Lord, I'm already stranded, but now I have no protection from the elements. The next morning, he was awakened by rescuers, and to his surprise, he asked, how did you know I was here? He asked, we saw your smoke signal, they replied. What that man thought was a horrific tragedy was actually a blessing in disguise. God never tells us things will work together when we want it, nor does he promise us things will work how we want it. But through his word, God promises us that all things work together for the good. Roman 28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for them who are called according to his purpose. Often when you're going through a time of great trouble, someone may seek to encourage you by quoting this verse. But if we're honest, sometimes we just don't want to hear it. Sometimes we may not even believe that. We may not even believe that all things work together for good. Sometimes we enjoy wallowing and our self-pity, and at times we just want to feel sorry for ourselves. Then there are times when we look at situation X, how, how can this be happening to me? Or better yet, how can any good come out of this? You may see, you may not see any way that it's possible for good to come out of your situation when you are laid off from work or when the repo man has come for the car, or when the eviction foreclosure notice has been served. When you receive the divorce papers in the mail, you may, not seri you may seriously question how can any good come from such heartache. When your child has become a drug addict or an alcoholic, you may ask, how is it that all things work together for good? When the test results come back and you have a terminal illness, you may cry and ask God, how is that all things working for good? It may be hard to see how God is going to bring good from your losing a spouse, parent, or child. Often when we face these trying times, some will tend to go beyond questioning God and even begin to blame him for their circumstances. It's important for us to understand that God's idea of good is not the same as what we would call good. God is working on events in our, of our life together for our final and eternal ultimate good. We, need, we tend to focus on the here and now, but God is focusing on the here and the hereafter. Sometimes troubles come directly from God for the purpose of strengthening our faith. Other times trouble comes as a result of sin in our lives and our Heavenly Father promised he will chasten those chasing his own. There are many reasons that we face times of difficulty. Regardless of why you're facing troubles, the good news is that God can use these things for our good. Some of you are facing extremely difficult situations at this very moment. It has often been said that you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or heading into a storm. You know, we come to church Sunday after Sunday, and I wish uh, one day we could, we could take off the plastic smiles, amen. We can take off the suits, you know, unhook the weaves. And, and, and really begin to see what people are going through. Many, many uh, people have turned from God. Troubles came and they began to face and doubt, face doubt and discouragement. As a result, they became either bitter or even angry with God. 
I'm not going to church anymore. Why should I pray? God is not answering. Perhaps someone listening to me here is on the verge of, that, of reaching that very place. But know this, when difficulties come, <clears throat> that's the time to run towards God and not to run away from God. There are others who are not bitter or angry with God, but you just want some answers. You just want to know why. Why, Lord? Some would say there is no answer to this question, but they are wrong. There is an answer to that question. In fact, there are several answers, and they are found in the word of God. First of all, in Romans 5th chapter and the third verse, he says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. James 1 and 2 gives us another answer. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For we know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. I believe Romans 28 also answers this question, but this, it answers the question also with a promise. It not only answers the question, but it gives us this promise. And I would like to talk about that promise as we consider this promise of greater good. The text says, and we know. First of all, we see the certainty of the promise. Notice Paul does not say, we think. He didn't say, we hope. Uh, he, he didn't say, we pray. He states the fact, we know. We know Paul possessed full assurance that all things work together for good, and he knows this. We can know this truth as well. How? By looking at what God has already brought us through. Paul, Paul, Paul was by far, I would say, the most spiritual Christian to live. I think spiritually he stood head and shoulders about, above any other Christian that walked this earth. And, and as spiritual as Paul was, Paul experienced just as much suffering as he did in, in serving. Paul, Paul, Paul talked about in Corinthians how much affliction he, that, he, that he dealt with and how they were afflicted to the point of despairing life. They didn't even want to live anymore. And some would think or feel today that if you're, if you're spiritual, then uh, these things are not supposed to happen to you. Uh, if you're spiritual, you're not supposed to get sick. If you're spiritual, you're not supposed to be broke. If you're spiritual, you're not supposed to have problems in your marriage. But the fact is, it don't matter how spiritual you are. When the suit comes off, when the weave is unhooked, when that plastic smile is removed, the reality is that everybody experiences afflictions. Consider what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8. He's considering the past experiences assure us that all things work together for the good. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8, we are afflicted in, afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that life, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Paul was reflecting on this past afflictions and said, said to himself, you already know. When, you, when you're going through a problem or you're hit with bad news, you have to just remind yourself, you already know. You already know what God has already done, so certainly you can trust him to get you through what you're going through right now. You already know how he's blessed you in your finances so he can get you through this turmoil. You already know how he's healed your family members or even yourself so you know he can do it again. So look at your neighbor and say, you already know. Paul had been through more than any of us can imagine. He has been in prison. He had been shipwrecked. He had been 
persecuted, he had been beaten, he had been stoned, he had been betrayed. Uh, through it all, God had proved himself faithful because he already knew. Take a moment to remember where you were this time last year. Take a, mem a moment to remember where you were this time two years ago. Take a moment and think about where you were this time last week. Some of us don't have to go back very far to know that God is in the blessing business. His portfolio is evidence that he can and he will do it. Think about all those times that God has been with you through the storms and the valleys. And consider this, if God loves you enough to save you, and he did, then he loves you enough to sustain you. He knows what you're facing, and he cares for you. Not only does he know what you are facing, but he knows why. Catch this. Every aspect of your current trouble is part of God's greater plan. Past experiences assist our faith and remind us that we can cling to God's pr pr promises. Look at your neighbor again and say, you already know. You also have to have a proper perspective. A proper perspective assures us that all things work together for the good. Paul did not live focused on the problems and the present. Instead, he was focused on the glories of the future. He was assured that regardless of the troubles he faced in this life, nothing could separate him from the love of Christ. Notice what he says in the 35th through 40th. 39th chapter of this same chap verse of this same chapter, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? But wait, there's more. As it is written, for the sake, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long, for we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely, unequivocally, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Thank you. And it's imperative that we keep this proper perspective. People often fall away during times of tribulation because they do not have the correct outlook. They're focused on the temporal as opposed to the eternal. The severity of their problems blind them to the sovereignty of the Savior. When trouble comes in your life, just remember there's a reason for it, and God has a plan, and his plan will work together for the good. Which brings me to my next point. We see in the text the context of this promise. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together. Now, this, this verse is often very um, over, oversimplified, uh, Romans 8 and 28. You know, uh, most people will use it in the context to say, oh, don't let life get you down. Uh, God is going to work it all out. Everybody, anybody heard that before? God's going to make everything better, but this is not what this text is saying. God did not remove Paul's storm from the, th from the flesh, but he did assure him that his grace was sufficient. God did not stop the Hebrew boys from going into the furnace, but he did go in there with him. And when we understand that God is with us in our tribulation, he gives us the strength we need to be sustained. And it, 
the, 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 the difficulties don't have the same effect as they would without him. God is in the midst of our difficulties, and he's always working in our lives to bring about his will, and many of the things that we endure in this life are simply part of the sanctification process. John MacArthur says it this way. He says, God is working out our good during this, this present life as well as ultimately in the life to come. No matter what happens in our lives as, as his children, the providence of God uses it for temporal as well as our internal, eternal benefit, sometimes by saving us from tragedies and sometimes from sending us through them in order to draw us closer to God. Yes, God is working all things together for the good, but remember, this is not merely for the temporal. God is focused on the eternal. In Romans 8 and 29, he says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I hope, I hate to disappoint anyone, but chances are pretty good that this verse does not mean what you've always thought it meant. It's not a promise that God is going to remove your troubles. It's not a promise that God is going to make you happy. It's not a promise that the doctor's report is going to be good. It is not a promise that your marriage will survive. It's not a promise that you will have enough money at the end of the month. This verse is not a guarantee of health and or wealth. But the context of this verse is this. God does what he does in your life to make you more like his son. Whatever it is, whatever it is, God does what he does in your life to make you more like his son. God will use things. He'll use bad things. He'll use in-between things to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's really the ultimate goal. That's, that's the path that every believer is on, being conformed into the image of Christ. And God will use what he uses. He will do what he does. He will allow what he will allow in order to bring the ultimate good, the greater good, into, into fruition in our lives. Text on moves on to show us the comprehensiveness of the promise. The comprehensiveness of the promise. The text says, all things, all things. There's, there's nothing excluded outside of all, all things. It's, it's, it's an inclusive word. There's nothing that God can't use to mold you to the image of his son. According to the word, everything that happens, happens for our good. The things that we don't like and the things that we do the things that we don't understand and the things that we do, the things that hurt and the things that don't, the things that break our hearts and the things that bring us joy, the things that make us cry and the things that make us smile, the things that make us want to quit and the things that make us want to press on. Everything, everything works for our good. Consider that, first of all, bountiful blessings work for our good. Now. That's probably pretty easy for most to understand. You know, if you're blessing, if you're blessed, if God blesses you, then it's for your good. You, you can see that good, you understand that. But God has blessed us with some amazing things, our homes, our possessions, our friends, our family, our health, and all of these things are pleasant things that bring good into our lives. God has also provided us with many spiritual blessings. He has secured our salvation, first of all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He's given us a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He's provided an abundant life here and promised us eternal life and a home in heaven. And so it's, it's easy to see how the blessings bring good in our lives. But sometimes it's more hard to see uh, how 
sorrowful things could be beneficial because notice troublesome times work together for our good as well. When trouble comes into our lives, the first reaction is probably not to rejoice. The Bible says that we can, in fact, we should. First Peter, first chapter six and six says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than the gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Troublesome times give strengthens our faith. In those times when we cannot handle things on our own, those times we have to know we have nowhere else to turn but to God. These times our faith building experiences. Though you may see it, may not see it at the time, though times work together, those times will work together for your good. I don't know what you're facing right now, I don't know what you're going through right now, but I do know that God can use your troubles to work out something great in your life. Satan's schemes can work together for our good. When Satan plots against us and seeks to do us harm, but God can use Satan's schemes for good. Job showed us that. You remember, you remember how uh, Satan and, and God were discussing Job, and uh, uh, Satan said, of course Job is going to worship you because you've given him everything he wants. He's, he's rich. You know, back then, you know, camels were like Cadillacs, and uh, 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 sheep were like, uh, were, like, were like sports cars, and so Job was a very rich man. And so Satan said, because you bless him, of course he's going to praise you. And so Satan, God gave Satan the permission to take everything away from Job, but he couldn't touch his soul. And through it all, long story short, you, you can go back and read the story. God got the glory at the end, and what seemed to be a plot from Satan to destroy Job turned out being a blessing that not only helped Job, but it also glorified God. So even Satan's schemes can be used. In other words, Satan is being pimped by God to glorify himself through you. He's being used by God to test you to give him the glory. Even wicked ways can work together for our good. Now, bear with me for a moment because I know that that sounds a little hard to believe, a little impossible, but it, it is, in fact, it is a fact that God can take our sins and use them to work things for good in our lives. Now, first and foremost, let me say this. Christians should sin less. Amen. We've learned that. We're not sinless, but we should sin less. And so we don't want to go out here with the act of fool free card because, first of all, there are consequences for those sins. There's never an excuse for justification for sin in the life of the child of God, but we will fail. We will miss the mark, and when we do, God can take our sin and use it for our good. I know I'm in Bible territory. David, David illustrates this truth. David sinned greatly. He lusted after Bathsheba, committed adultery, and had her husband killed. Let me also remind you that David suffered greatly due to the consequences of his sin. In fact, his, ne his life was never the same again. But after David repented and returned to the Lord, God blessed David and Bathsheba with a son named Solomon. Solomon eventually became heir to the throne, 
and was the wisest man to ever live. True testimony that God can even use our sins, our wickedness, to become, bring about our good. You may not see the good right now, but God has a plan for your life. <clears throat> and that plan is for you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. God promised promise concerning the greater good is not as promise that we'll ever be face suffering, that we will never face suffering, but is one that gives comfort in the midst of that suffering. Which brings me to my next point. We see the comfort in this promise. We see the comfort in this promise. God is all powerful. He's all knowing and he's ever present. He's able to take control of every situation and any situation in life. He is sovereign and he cares for you. When you face those difficult times of life, just remember that God is behind every circumstance you encounter. Think about that. When the difficulty comes, you've got to tell yourself, God's got something to do with this. And God loves me. He can use the difficult difficulties on your behalf in your life to strengthen your faith. He can use the trials that you face to mature you spiritually. He can use it to reach other people. He can use your life to bring glory to his name. No matter how bad things may be, no matter how difficult your situation is, remember all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8 and 28 contains a wonderful promise from God, but it is the comforting and encouraging, but the, the fact that the fact is, this promise does not apply to everyone. The final truth about this promise that I'd like to consider is that there, there's the condition of the promise. The condition of the promise. The text says, to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. We've already noted how this verse is often misused and commonly um, oversimplified. It's also regularly shortened or edited. In most cases, all you hear is all things work together for good. Dep depending on the version of the Bible that you're reading, that last half of the verse is often omitted. The verse is a promise to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. This passage is a promise to the born again child of God. If you are not born again, your temporary troubles, your temporary sufferings here on earth, are going to be pale in comparison to the horrors of an eternal eternity separated from God. I encourage you and invite you to join, turn to Jesus today. You can then claim this wonderful promise that all things work together for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Those who are born again can rest in the fact that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a great promise. What a great assurance. What a great assurance that we have and that God is sovereign. He, he, he has a way that, that is made, can make things better than anything that we could think, dream, or imagine. I'm hoping now, um, I'll tell you the story. And it's a story of a hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. 
she's a classic example of how God works all things for the good. The world is the beneficiary of her memorial, memorable hymns. Yet what worked together for good was born out of her personal tragedy. For she became blind at the age of five years old. At only the age of eight, she began to write poetry and hymns, writing over 8,000 sacred songs and hymns. She has blessed the world with such popular songs as Blessed Assurance, songs like Safe in the Arms of Jesus, songs like Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. God used her difficulty to bring good for her and for us, but more importantly, for his glory. I know, that, I know for a fact that some of you are going through some terrible times, even right now. Some of you are facing some devastating circumstances. I hope you're encouraged today to understand, first of all, that God has something to do with this. Because God loves you, he has something to do with it. He either allowed it or he, he put you in it, but he has something to do with it for the greater good. God has a plan for your life, and ultimately he wants to conform us into the image of Christ. We have to trust in his many promises. Remember God's promise concerning our greater good. God bless you. someone here today that wants to accept this invitation, this invitation into to receive the greatest gift any person could receive, better than anything you could receive on your birthday, on Christmas, or any other time of the year. That is the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. If you're here today and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have not received the right to this promise, this is your opportunity right now. Don't you come. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to work it out. Let God do that for you. Let him help you through it. I say all the time, if I wasn't saved, what would I do, church? Get saved. If I wasn't saved, I would get saved. accepted Christ, that life happens. Certainly we understand that. But God brought you here for a reason. This is your opportunity to come back home. Is there one? God, for the soul that is here today that don't know you, 
We pray, oh God, that you will save the sinner and reclaim the backslider. It is in Jesus' name we pray that you be the, you give the, you be the, do the drawing power, oh God, that you will draw those that may be even straddling the fence right now, contemplating in their mind. Help them to understand this now is the time and today is the day. We give your name the praise and the glory for what you've already done and we're trusting you for what you're going to do. It's in the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. <laughs>